you guys had a guest on last Thursday, and uh, Matt Leck, who I guess isn't here, also had him on. His name is Matt Huber. Yep. Uh, I watched both of both of the interviews with with him on Left Reckoning and Majority Report. And, and while he definitely makes some great points, I, I have some pretty strong disagreements with him. Okay. And I guess I'd like to bring them up. Sure. Um, <laughs> so uh, I guess I guess if people haven't seen the interview, what, we should kind of explain what his, his points were. And, and if you want to do that, that's fine, or I can explain it. Basically, his points were that targeting production uh, as a way to combat climate change is the most productive route as opposed to uh, focusing on individual consumptive practices, consumption practices. Right, right. And he, he, he has a pretty strong argument against degrowthers as well. And he, he, he was kind of arguing that trying to convince the working class or, you know, the average American through science and data might not work as well if that science and data says that they'll have to take a, they'll have to make a personal decision to decrease their quality of life. And, and these things like carbon footprints are not useful because, you know, an oil CEO who's vegan and rides his bike has a smaller carbon footprint than a climate activist or whatever. Who yeah drives a Hummer and eats burgers. And and I agree with those or a, He said a rich I, person who does those, I mean, for, or an actor, like, you know, an actor who flies on a private plane and, you know, whatever. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and I think that these are really good points when it comes to, like, the political messaging around what we should be saying about climate activism. Because, like, when Joe Biden comes out and, like, or Kamala Harris says, I'm going to take away your meat. Like, nobody wants Joe Biden to take <laughs> their meat. Yeah. Um, I, I agree with that. And, and like, w- w- when it comes to the degrowthers who are, like, walking around town with a donkey saying, like, we need to go back to monkey or whatever, like, uh, it, it's, it's easy to create a straw man of the degrowth argument because uh, people don't really want to do organic farming and work in the fields all day and, like, give up their cars and give up, they're luxury items, and and I understand that. And and I guess my point is that, um, from a scientific perspective, which which Matt Huber, Huber kind of dismissed at the beginning of this thing, but from a scientific perspective, I don't think that it's possible to solve the climate crisis that we're facing by just replacing the energy grid and you know oil and gas with clean energy. And, and I agree that that's what we should go towards, but, but I guess my point is that the overall amount of energy consumed by society has to go down yeah. uh, for us to solve the issue. Like, we, we can't just um, – and that's, it's, it's kind of unfortunate because it's a similar argument that a lot of, like, neoliberal types make who are like, we're going to continue infinite growth and we're just going to replace everything with clean energy and then somehow we're going to continue this – high standard of living for everyone and even raise up the, you know, people in poor countries as well by giving them clean energy. And I I just think it's physically impossible to do that because the amount of resources that would be needed to create all of these solar panels, like lithium extraction is destructive to the environment. And it's kind of, um, and I agree that it's great that if we, if we do go towards clean energy, the workers should get the profit from that. Like, I agree. But if we nationalize the oil industry and it's socially owned, you know, people are making the profit from the oil industry. I kind of think that there is just as much of a perverse incentive to continue burning fossil fuels for the workers benefiting from it as there is from one greedy capitalist benefiting from it. So I guess that's sort of a disagreement. I well, have I would say that the nationalization of the oil industry would be so that one price gouging is not a thing and two, so that it can be detransitioned without all of like the market forces forcing it back into, you know, our system like the, the we have zero growth I mean, zero growth zero control in my opinion right now over uh like the fact that we are held hostage by these companies like that the, the nationalization would be a way to essentially shut it down sure and and you can see countries like norway that have a more nationalized oil industry that are going towards green energy and and 
and that might be because they have control over their oil industry, but but they haven't really stopped <laughs> like drilling and all of that. Yeah, uh, they, they're doing a better job than the U.S. And uh, but I but I guess um, that's sort of an ancillary point. And and my main point is that I think that even since the 70s, people have been arguing that we need some sort of political messaging that's going to tell convince people that we need a simpler way of living like like all these things like fast fashion and you know luxury items like going into the supermarket and seeing 10,000 different pa- plastic packaged frozen foods and you know the, the actual food like the meat and produce is only a small part and everything else is just like this super refined form of energy that's not sustainable uh, and, you know, plastic water bottles. Like, like I agree, it's obnoxious to, to concern troll someone for buying a plastic water bottle. Nobody wants to hear that. But on a societal level, I don't think that we should have 10,000 plastic water bottles in every gas station that consumers can just buy. So I guess my argument is, like, I agree that we shouldn't be forcing consumers to make better choices when all of these options are still available. But I... And I, I, I agree that this is radical. Like, I'm kind of putting forth a radical message, but, like, I think we need some sort of, like, authoritarian, eco, you know, government to say no more plastic water bottles, no more, you know, re- limiting meat consumption, limiting cars and replacing it with public transit. Like, and these are all things that take away people's freedom. But from a climate perspective, it's stuff that's necessary, and there's no good political messaging, and I'll include myself in that. I'm probably not messaging well, but there's no po- politicians out there that make that argument. And there's, like, I would like to recommend a book uh, or an author, Howard Odom, who has been saying like since the 70s that the, we can't have infinite growth, we can't have infinite energy usage in a finite system. And, and he's made all of these energy models that show that, like, the amount of energy it takes to cr- to refine energy to a more uh, a more uh, you know refining energy to to be more refined. Uh, sorry, I'm I'm not explaining it well. But basically, like the amount of energy we would use to create clean energy systems is more than the initial amount of energy input, and so it's just kind of like making more and more refined energy, but that system is super wasteful when we need to get to a steady energy state where we're not constantly increasing the amount of energy we use and i understand that this is a scientific argument it's not very convincing to like the average layman but yeah my again i I, um can we have to run but I, i mean my fear immediately though is just the uh the in unequal distribution of that kind of regulation that can be punitive on working class and poorer people. And I agree that, you know, the global north needs to readjust to a degree. I mean, I'm not saying like our consumptive practices need to escalate to the degree that they have been. Um, but my fear, though, is that there are there are poor people within the United States, not just, you know, uh, the, the country is not wealthy in, in mass. Um, and in other uh, highly consumptive countries that would bear the brunt of this. So, um, you know, that- well, when did I say that? When did I say that I don't want to lift up people in poor countries? Like, what part of part of no, my no, not poor. That's no, what I was trying to say. my point is that I feel that when you say it's an author- authoritarian uh, uh, environmental government that would be enforcing these kinds of things, I feel that the punitive um effects would be largely felt by poorer people within wealthier nations yeah. that is my I, I understand that i understand that and my point is like these things like you know plastic water bottles or fast fashion being able to buy a hundred different color hoodies or like if we replace cars with public transit these things wouldn't actually really hurt people like people would feel like they're being hurt people would complain especially right wingers like joe biden's trying to take my meat and all this stuff but on like a spiritual level, you know, we don't need all this consumption. And, and I guess that's sort of why I'm a degrowther and it's like a fundamental sort of philosophy I have. And I understand that it's extremely radical. 
And yes. I understand that it's a form of austerity politics yes. and that there's not good messaging out there. And that's sort of my problem, right? Like, like I get cast as this crazy guy walking around with a donkey or this like self-flagellating liberal climate scientist. And I understand that. Like, it is a radical position. But, but at the end of the day, I don't think it's possible to just kind of nationalize the oil industry and make clean energy and then just continue business as usual. And I think that's something people have to reckon with. All right. I'll well, off now. I yeah. appreciate you taking my call. Appreciate it, Ken. Thank you. Bye. Um, all right. So let's, uh, let's go to a clip then. Um, glad we have I'm you here. back. You, I'm yeah. here. Glad yeah. to have you back. You reset your internet. I reset my internet, but it was weird because only ping was going down. Like I usually have the YouTube channel open, like the YouTube video open, so I could follow hmm. the, the, the 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 live chat feed, and that didn't go down. So I have no idea. But we're here, so who cares? It's working. All right. You know, go on. What I was going to say, you know, just one thing to the caller's point, and I think it's something that people are, you know, always grappling with. At least they've been grappling with it since I've been in high school and having to make my own carbon footprint via like the little you know, website that they have for you is, you know, what is the role of individualistic solutions to solving larger societal problems? And I think when it comes to America, it can be a double-edged sword to advocate for any individual change because it can be, you know, used to foist the responsibility for and the entire responsibility for changing like larger structures onto the single individuals who navigate it. Whereas, you know, for me, I think the best case scenario is that people need a value shift as though like that the Nicole was saying, people people shifting values at the individual level would lead for them to demand better from the government that serves them. Obviously in America, we don't know that feedback system is very broken, but it's one of those things that is going to have to get better either by proactivity or in reaction to like the growing climate apocalypse eventually. But, you know, it's certainly not sufficient to say that we can, I mean, rather the people who pretend less though it's sufficient for everybody to just choose to make the right choice. And therefore we don't have to worry about like the government, you know, doing the right thing or companies doing the right thing. I think are the people, and maybe that's the straw man, but those are the people who, when they're advocating individualistic solutions, should be you should be wary of because it's just not it's just not a solution for the problem. But I don't think there really is a solution for the problem unless the government at the highest level, which I wouldn't call authoritarian, but you know, because we're legally limited from doing a lot of things that people might find fun on a personal level. But you know, if the government at the highest level and also internationally is able to work in order to place caps on carbon emissions, place caps caps on, you know, the amount of methane we've released into the atmosphere. Other than that, you know, we're just relying on everybody's, you know, everybody's individual best interest to be in line with what the long-term planet's best interests are. And I don't know why they would be. That's not like a practical thing to assume.